Thank you. Yeah. How many people can relate to that? Like have to do it right feeling. Do you see this room? <laughs> right. <laughs> so I think that the, the recognizing it, right. Oh, there it is popping up. And for me anyway, the practice of noticing what's my relationship to that. Right. It, there's some times when that pops up and I think, oh, yeah, there's that habit, <laughs> of course. <laughs> right. And that's much more pleasant and much softer than fuck there I am again trying to do it right. Oh, I fucked up what I do wrong now. Like all that, that layering, right, which we might call papancha or proliferation that happens. Right. But there's for whatever conditioning, there's this habit. And then I'm noticing it. I can appreciate oh, I'm noticing it. Because right? it's that stuff that we don't notice, it just keeps going in there under the radar, messing with us, right? But when we see it, oh, oh, oh. I just, I just want to add, there's something about it. It's really from your teaching that I'm understanding that noticing is something that I can do with love and kindness as opposed to just sort of as a cognitive mode, you know, noticing without emotion. Mm. So I just really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm really glad. Yeah, thanks a lot for that, Tom. As, as some of you know, I'm, I'm about to sing. I'm not a singer, but as some of you know, Tig is back in town, and Tig is responsible for how beautiful this place is. And I, I've mentioned that in the past. And we were talking the other day about he thanked he he thanked me. He came to me for a one-on-one -on -one session many years ago, early on in his practice. And he was recalling that the other night after teaching here. And he thanked me for inspiring him to find his way, his path. And I, I have lots of students who are becoming meditation teachers or becoming mindfulness teachers. And I think that that's, if I can impart anything in them, that's it. Like your path, your way, your transmission. And to hear that this piece of my path and my practice of to, can I bring tenderness? Can I bring softness? Has already been transmitted, right? It's only been a few weeks that I've been here. So to hear that picked up really, really warms my heart. And it, it reminds me the importance of finding your way to navigate life. Like we're all navigating dukkha, right? If, if you're alive, you're navigating dukkha. Like that's how it is. And this idea that it shouldn't suck, like, that's crazy making. Shit sucks. And then it's cool again. And then it sucks. And that's cool. And that's wonderful. And then you miss it. And like, there's this ride happening. The ride isn't the problem. Yeah. This is a little bit off, but. I had the opportunity to sit with Ajahn Brahm at Google, like many years ago, I was teaching at Google and he was visiting and I got to go and it was cool. One of his books is who ordered this truckload of dung? <laughs> it's like, yup. But he was telling a story about you can be mindful. I, I, I'm not a storyteller. But he was telling a story of like, you know, you, you have your palace or whatever, and then you have guards, it's your palace, and they're standing guard, sentries at the gate, and they can be mindful as the robbers come in and take all of your precious things, and they can be mindful as the robbers go out and just take all of your precious things. Like, mindfulness alone is not the ticket. Like, you, just awareness is, sometimes people will say, like, awareness alone is enough, but I don't think that that's true. It's what, what is the attitude? What is the energy of the awareness? It's like, oh, I feel crappy. Can I tend to myself that I feel crappy? Or am I in a mind state where I then am shitting on myself for feeling crappy? Like it happens, right? It happens, but how am I relating to it? How do I care for it? And so I feel like his message was that we need tenderness with it. You'll hear a lot of insight teachers talk about kind awareness. I find myself in my own practice and my teaching a lot these days really exploring like, and what's my relationship to that? What's my relationship to that? How am I with that? And sometimes my relationship to that is I'm really aversive. 
I'm really angry. I'm really pissed off, like all the layers. And sometimes it's laughing at it. So tonight we're going to be exploring the seven of these 14 mindfulness trainings. And as I was thinking about that, I thought it might be interesting to share a little bit of my experience today. I had the great privilege to wake up in Tahoe, right on Lake Donner, staying in a very simple environment, but it's right on the lake. And it's high enough that the curtains can be opened and there's still privacy. So I get to wake up with some distance, but I wake up to the lake and everything's covered in snow this morning at seven. And so I wake up and I go like enjoy the snow and I feel like a little kid, just delighted enjoying the snow. And after a while, my partner wakes up and he immediately gets on his phone. He like spends hours obsessing about what are the road conditions? Are we going to be able to get home safely? Oh, maybe I need to go and buy snow chains. It's just like totally spun out. So he does his own spinning. And then finally he gets up because you know, he's a data man. So he has to do lots and lots and lots of research first. So he does an hour of research on his phone, decides we need to, he needs to go and buy snow chains. So he tells me, I'm like, okay. And then he's mad at me that I'm happy, like that I'm enjoying the beauty of this environment. I'm like, okay. And I said, well, do you want a snack? Because I had, there was half a banana and half an apple. He's like, no, I believe you. I don't want I'm like, okay. Like totally biting my head off because he's stressed out. And I could, I could meet him. No problem. I can turn it on. Like, it's easy. And I didn't. I was like, oh, okay, you're stressed out. Okay. And I, I, I greeted him a fond adieu and I continued to enjoy the beautiful environment and then I kind of got worried when I hadn't heard from him in an hour but I was like it's okay and then he texted me he's like give me the play-by-play -play at the store ask me what he should do I'm like I don't know babe you you know I trust you you have my support whatever you decide is okay but he's spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and he gets back and I offer to make him some food again he bites my head off and I started to and Pema Chojin talks about like not taking the hook, not taking the bait. The term is Shenpa. I started, I started and I was like, no, no, I got to be in choice, which is part of the freedom of practice when we can drop in and be in choice. And he, he had to use the restroom. And so I got a chance to cool down again. And I made him this food that he'd said he didn't want, but I was like, it's 11 o'clock and you have been up since eight and you haven't eaten anything. We're gonna be on the road for at least three hours and we're gonna eat some food. Or at least I'm gonna cook it for you, you eat it or not. That's on you, but I'm cooking it. And he ate it. And he settled down and then he got all anxious again when we were like getting on the road and everything. And then it, everything worked out and he released. And we had a pleasant three hour, three and a half hour drive. And it could have been hell because I could have gotten pissed off right there with him because he spoke to me in some ways that I do not love. And I didn't. I was just like, oh, I had awareness in my mind that he's stressed out. And I don't have to take it on. It feels like he was talking to me. Right, I'm there, and the words are like in my direction, but it has nothing to do with me. Hmm. And it had nothing to do with me. Part reminds me of anatta, of not self that the Buddha teaches so clearly. Like it's not personal. I love Ruth King's offering translation of anatta. Not personal. It's nothing is personal. Nothing is not personal. It's conditioned. And we can influence those conditions, right? So it wasn't at me. But the thing about that that I thought would be relevant for this evening was keeping my side of the street clean. I could have met him. I could have escalated. I could have gotten all righteous. Don't talk to me like that. Like, just I could have just gone. I didn't have to. I didn't get sucked in. I was just like, oh, yeah, you're stressed out. And you're mad at me. That I'm not, right? That I'm relaxed and I'm enjoying this beauty that we're in. Yeah. And so I don't know how much the mindfulness trainings will, will point you in that direction. 
but the keeping our own side of the street clean to be conscious of our own behavior so that when we sit down to meditate or so that when we enter a procedure, which we don't know if we're going to come out of or when we're on our deathbed, we don't have as many regrets. Like you're, we're going to have some, you know, you're, like I said, we're human, but it's like, oh yeah, right, I'm living this life in more choice, in more choice. All right, so enough riff and let's settle into practice. We'll have about half an hour of practice together and then we'll offer the trainings. And I'll probably make some obnoxious noises up here. Please excuse my nose blowing. Notice your relationship to the sound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the stories that the mind makes. I do not have a lady like nose blowing. <laughs> But it worked. I'm getting comfortable. Seeing if the body wants to move a little bit more to find that comfortable posture, small movements, big movements. One more layer, one less layer. Another sip of tea or water. And then finding a comfortable posture. Standing, seated, lying down, or even walking. A posture in which you can be comfortable. Comfortable. and awake and alert. So lengthening the spine can help with that wakefulness and alertness. The crown of the head pulling up toward the sky. The shoulders broadening. The body settling into the earth. Allowing ourselves to be held by the earth. She's always holding us. Gravity is always there. Can we feel it, experience it, tune into it? And can we let go a little bit? As we bring awareness into the body, we might notice that the body begins to soften, or maybe we can help it. And for those of us who are here in the space, we can enjoy the sound of the church bells, calling us home to the present moment. Listening to the bells. Continuing to listen 
to sounds arising and passing. If that supports you in resting into the present moment, Sounds just like emotions and weather, heart states and mind states. These sounds are conditioned and they arise and are sustained for a while and pass away. Cultivating awareness of sound, of arising and passing, can be a great support in our cultivation of awareness of anicca or impermanence, not permanent. So if you're curious, you could spend these 30 minutes tuning in to awareness of sound arising and passing and the space in between the sounds. Resting in awareness of hearing. If that's feeling supported or you're curious to try it, please stay with awareness of sound and allowing the rest of the words that I offer to just be sound. If that's not really landing for you, you might tune into another sense door. If the mind is particularly busy or you're sleepy, you might tune into awareness of sight. Choosing one of the candles up here next to me. Or something soothing, simple, that's not moving. Or your own candle if you're at home. A flower, a wall, a floor, a ceiling, a plant. Something the eye can rest on. Noticing rest being a key word. Or giving the mind something to do. so that it can let go of all that other crap.
Or maybe you'd be more supported by awareness of breath. This constant companion. Bringing awareness to the sensation of breath in the low belly or the chest or the nostrils. Or maybe for this practice period, you'd like to practice resting, just resting, allowing the body to rest. And being aware, becoming curious about this experience of the body resting just as we bring awareness and curiosity to the breath or to the field of sight or hearing. Feeling, experiencing our chosen object of awareness. Perhaps you explored all of those sense doors with me. Just choosing one doesn't have to be perfect. It's not going to be. Choosing a place to become more attuned to, more interested, more curious about. Just for this practice period. There's so much to be aware of.
However, you might be practicing occasionally noticing your relationship to the moment. Noticing perhaps moments of contentness. Moments of chasing after. Moments of pushing away. And then maybe noticing your relationship to that, the contentment, the chasing, the pushing. That might not be available. And if it is, just feeling it. Resting in awareness. Resting, resting. And becoming more and more curious about your experience.
perhaps asking yourself, what am I aware of? Hearing, seeing, breathing, being. Some heart response of contentment, clinging, or aversion. What am I aware of? A thought or an emotion. How am I with that? Perhaps a little seed of wisdom can sprout. It can't be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. It's not the goal. Or the seed of letting go can sprout and bloom. Softening and allowing and resting in, resting in to your chosen object or a broad spaciousness. Feeling the body rest, it's a precious gift of rest. The mind keeps doing its thing. That's not a problem. How are we relating to the mind? And how are we relating to that relationship? Perhaps we're judging ourselves for judging ourselves for judging ourselves. Or perhaps we're having moments of inner laughter, joy, freedom, or letting go. The mind will think. That's okay. Can we relax around the thinking? Oh, yeah, hi, thinking. Freedom from making it wrong.
And occasionally we might check in with our posture, rooting down through the feet and seat, lifting up through the crown of the head, broadening out through the shoulders. Resting here for as much as is possible without insisting, straining, or striving. Resting. Continuing to rest in meditative awareness, if that's feeling good for you. Or expanding this awareness that's arisen, however slight it might be, into movement, really feeling the body moving, being in this change. And as you're ready, adding in light.
And as I said this evening, we'll explore the first seven of the 14 mindfulness trainings of the Order of Interbeing. And I'll read a little intro, and I'm going to pass my phone around with the trainings on and ask that seven voices share. See how that goes. So the 14 mindfulness trainings. The 14 mindfulness trainings are modern distillation of the traditional bodhisattva precepts of Mahayana Buddhism and were created by Thich Nhat Hanh in Saigon in 1966. So it might be in, might not be complete, but often Buddhism is thought of or spoken of as having three schools of Buddhism, Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. And kind of generally, Mahayana includes Zen. And so we think of Soto Zen, like Green Gulch and Tatsahar and City Center. But even that comes from China. Chan came to Japan, but it also went to Vietnam. And that's where Thich Nhat Hanh came in. And then he's brought in others. So there's a lot of Theravada and stuff and what he does too. But just for some context about some of these words. So for whatever benefit that might be. Monastic and lay friends who have made a vow in a formal ceremony to receive, study, and observe these 14 mindfulness trainings are known as members of the Order of Interbeing. That's what the silly brown jacket is about. The Order of Interbeing, through the Plum Village lineage of Thich Nhat Hanh, belongs to the Lin Chi or Rinzai tradition of Zen Buddhism. So we can talk more about that at another time if people are interested or you can investigate on your own. The first six members of the order were colleagues and students of Thich Nhat Hanh who worked with him. So the seven of them worked together, or the six of them worked together, relieving the suffering of war in Vietnam, right? So this is 1966. A lot of fighting going on in that part of the world at that moment in time. So they were relieving this particular suffering of war in Vietnam. In joining the Order of Interbeing, they dedicated themselves to the continuous practice, the continuous practice of mindfulness, ethical behavior, and compassionate action in society. I think it's nice to have the aspiration for continual practice. One of the things about the Plum Village tradition that's been really meaningful for me is this possibility to be mindful of, of anything, of everything, that it's not just this quiet silent time that we just have, but it's something that can be available for having a sip of tea or blowing our nose or coughing or lighting a match. It's like anything we can bring presence to. So it's not that you're going to continuously be present, but that you're continuously practice, right? It's a practice. Today, these 14 mindfulness trainings outline a way of practicing harmoniously in community followed by residents at all of the international monastic practice centers in the Plum Village tradition. And there are now the more than 2000 lay members of the Order of Interbeing active in local communities worldwide. And as I said, the pieces that the trains were as we're gonna read them were presented by Thich Nhat Hanh at the great ordination ceremony held in Plum Village in February of 2012. So they've gone through various iterations over the years. That's one of the things that's also cool about this tradition is it's alive. And as a Sangha ourselves, we might modify them. I will bring them in a printed form and we can play with them and see, oh yeah, no, yes, maybe making modifications that they work for us as a community. So I'm gonna pass my phone around. I will offer them for Zoom next time, but not today. So you can just listen and all of us can practice listening. And when you read, speak up so that the mic picks you up. And there'll be a heading and then a paragraph. And then when you get to the next big heading, you can just pause and then we can pass it again.
like a, another intro. The 14 mindfulness trainings are the very essence of the order of interbeing. They are the torch lighting our path, the both carrying us, the teacher guiding us. They allow us to touch the nature of interbeing in everything that is, and to see that our happiness is not separate from the happiness of others. Interbeing is not a theory. It is a reality that can be directly experienced by each of us at any moment in our daily lives. The 14 mindfulness trainings help us cultivate concentration and insight which free us from fear and the illusion of the separate self. The first line of mindfulness training, openness. Aware of the suffering created by the fanaticism and intolerance, you are determined not to be Idiomatrous about or bound to any doctrine, theory, or ideology, even Buddhist ones. We are committed to seeking or seeing the Buddhist teachings as guide, guiding means that help us learn to look deeply at the understanding and compassion. They are not doctrines to fight, kill, or die for. We understand that fanaticism in its many forms is a result of perceiving things in a humanistic and um, discriminative manner. We will train ourselves to look at everything with openness and the insight of the things of being in order to transform dogmatism and violence in ourselves and the world. And then can you repeat the name of the training? So it's the first mindfulness training. So that'll be the model. Second mindfulness training, non-attachment to views. Aware of the suffering created by attachment to views, wrong perceptions. We are determined to avoid being narrow-minded and bound to present views. We're committed to learning, practicing non-attachment to views, to being open to others' experiences and insights in order to benefit from the collective wisdom. We are aware that the knowledge we presently possess is not changeless, it's absolute truth. Insights is revealed through the practice of compassionate listening, deep looking, and letting go of notions rather than through the accumulation of intellectual knowledge. Truth is found in life, and we will observe life within and around us in every moment, ready to learn throughout our lives. <clears throat> Um, Sophie, can you repeat? So it's the second mindfulness training. Second like training, non-attachment to cues. Thank you. The third mindfulness training, freedom of thought. Aware of the suffering brought about when we impose our views on others, we are determined not to force others, even our children, by any means whatsoever, such as authority, threat, money, propaganda, or indoctrination to adopt our views. We're committed to respect the right of others to be different, to choose what to believe and how to decide. We will, however, learn to help others let go of and transform fanaticism and narrowness through loving speech and compassionate dialogue. That's freedom of thought. The fourth mindfulness training, awareness of suffering. Aware that looking deeply at the nature of suffering can help us develop understanding and compassion. We are determined to come home to ourselves, to recognize, accept, embrace, and listen to our own suffering, 
with the energy of mindfulness. We will do our best not to run away from our suffering or cover it up with consumption, practice conscious breathing, and walking to look deeply into the roots of our suffering. We know we can realize the path leading to the transformation of suffering only when we understand deeply the roots of suffering. Once we have understood our own suffering, we will be able to understand the suffering of others. We are committed to finding ways, including personal contact using telephone, electronic, audiovisual, and other means, to be with those who suffer so we can help them transform their suffering into compassion, peace, and joy. This is the fourth mindfulness training awareness of suffering. Let's give it a beat to settle and notice what's in the body. Resonance, dissonance. The fifth mindfulness training, compassionate, healthy living. Aware that true happiness is rooted in peace, solidity, freedom, and compassion. We are determined not to accumulate wealth while millions are hungry and dying, nor to take as the aim of our life fame, power, wealth, or sensual pleasure, which can bring much suffering and despair. We will practice looking deeply into how we nourish our body and mind with edible foods, sense impressions, volition, and consciousness. We are committed not to gamble or to use alcohol, drugs, or any other products which bring toxins into our own and the collective body and consciousness, such as certain websites, electronic games, music, TV programs, films, magazines, books, and conversations. We will consume in a way that preserves compassion, well-being, and joy in our bodies and consciousness, and in the collective body and consciousness of our families, our society, and earth. That's the fifth mindfulness training, compassionate, healthy living. Six mindfulness training, taking care of anger. Aware that anger blocks communication and creates suffering, we are committed to taking care of the energy of anger when it arises and to recognize and transform the seeds of anger that lie deep in our consciousness. When anger manifests, we are determined not to do or say anything, but to practice mindful breathing or mindful walking to acknowledge, embrace, and look deeply into our anger. We know that the roots of anger are not outside of ourselves, but can be found in our wrong perceptions and lack of understanding of the suffering in ourselves and others. By contemplating impermanence, we will be able to look in the, the eyes of compassion at ourselves and at those we think are the cause of our anger, and to recognize the preciousness of our relationships. We will practice right diligence in order to nourish our capacity of understanding, love, and joyful inclusiveness, gradually transforming our anger, violence, and fear, and helping others do the same. The sick mindfulness training, taking care of anger. The so seventh month of training, dwelling happily in the present moment. Aware that life is available only in the present moment, we're committed to training ourselves to live deeply each moment of being alive. We will not, we will try not to lose ourselves in dispersion or be carried away by regrets about the past worries about the future or craving, anger, or jealousy in the present. Mm -hmm. We will practice mindful breathing to be aware of what is happening in the here and the now. We are determined to learn the heart of mindful living by touching the wonders 
refreshing and healing element that are inside and around us in all creation. In this way, we will be able to cultivate seeds of joy, peace, love, and understanding in ourselves, thus facilitating the work of transformation of healing in our consciousness. We're aware that the way of happiness depends primarily on our mental attitude and not on external condition, and that we can live happily in the present moment simply by remembering that we already have more than enough. So it's a lot of words and um, many of us in the space got to read those of you who are on zoom you really got to practice listening and i'd love to see what's here as a result of that and it might just be like oh my god it was so many words whatever that's fine and there might be something that kind of got awoken in you and I'll, I'll just offer the titles again. So the seventh mindfulness training, dwelling happily in the present moment. For me, the key line of that is we're simply, simply, uh -huh, simply remembering that we already have more than enough conditions to be happy. The sixth mindfulness training, taking care of anger. The line in that that jumped out for me as I heard Jimmy We know that the roots of anger are not outside of ourselves, but can be found in our wrong perceptions and lack of understanding of the suffering in ourselves and others. The fifth mindfulness training, compassionate, healthy living, not consuming a bunch of crap all the time. The fourth mindfulness training, awareness of suffering. Right? Can we actually be with the suffering? I feel like this training talks about the suffering outside of ourselves, but I got enough suffering in here. Like, I don't need any extra help, but can I be with the suffering? The third mindfulness training, freedom of thought. Right? We're not going to impose our views on others. And non-attachment to views, I feel like these two are quite similar in a way, but this one helps me to not be so caught in this idea that I'm right but to know the wisdom emerges over time. Truth is found in life, and we will observe life within and around us in every moment, ready to learn throughout our lives. We are aware that the knowledge we presently possess is not changeless absolute truth. I love that line so much. Insight is revealed through the practice of compassionate listening, deep looking, letting go, da, 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 rather than through the accumulation of intellectual knowledge. That's not attachment to view. And the first mindfulness training that we offered tonight was openness. All the problems with fanaticism. All right. So, a little recap. If there is anything that's up from Zoom land or here in the space and maybe first if there's anyone who hasn't spoken in the space who has something that's alive in them we'd love to hear from you and then of course everyone but just like let's give it a beat if anything is alive for anyone whose voice we haven't heard aside from reading reading doesn't count if there's anything that's alive in you a reflection or a question